My name is Jenny Adler and I'm a conservation photographer. I am a free diver and a cave diver and most of the stories that I tell are often hidden beneath the surface. I live in Gainesville, Florida, which is north central Florida, and it's kind of not the typical Florida people would think of. A little more rural, it's woodsy, and it's actually home to more than a thousand freshwater springs. That's throughout Florida in general, but the highest concentration of freshwater springs is here in north central Florida. The Santa Fe River is actually a tributary of the Suwannee River and sometimes manatees will come up in the winter and come there to sort of eat the grasses and be in the warmer water. It has a lot of freshwater springs on it and these springs are actually basically eyes into the aquifer. The way that that works here in Florida is that it's limestone and it looks kind of like Swiss cheese. So in some places there are holes that are very small and in other places there are large passageways that we call conduits. And sometimes people can swim through them. So that's why this is the cave diving capital of the world. But besides being a place where cave divers go, this water also supplies more than 90% of us here in Florida with our drinking water. So it's important that we protect it. I grew up in Massachusetts, just north of Boston. I grew up in the ocean. I can't remember not being able to swim. I learned to sail and row and snorkel all north of Boston in this freezing water that I never even realized was cold because they're just so excited to be in it. I then, as I got older, I realized that I wanted to study science and so it was a natural fit to say, maybe I'll study marine biology and ecology. And that's what I did in college. That's the algae that's sort of taken over everywhere. I came to Florida in 2011 when I graduated undergrad and I came here to work as a biologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. And I'd never spent much time in freshwater growing up since the ocean was there. And I got a suggestion from a fellow biologist who was like, you should just check out the springs and see what it's like. And so over time, I just became addicted and I became obsessed with springs and swimming in them. It was finding the ecosystem and falling in love with it first that then inspired me later to maybe want to work in it and want to protect it. And so I started taking pictures. I was originally going to do a PhD looking at the impact of dissolved oxygen on snail grazing in the springs, but I really saw the power of imagery and photography to communicate science and to connect people with the spring ecosystems. Communicating science is an essential part of science itself, and so I've just switched over to a different role within sort of the scientific process. A few years ago, there was a fellow PhD student, it was when I was in grad school, that was doing dive trace studies down in Silver Spring. And it's one of the biggest springs in Florida. And you actually can't swim at that spring. And one of the reasons is because there are so many gators. But he got a scientific permit to do a, what's called a dive trace study there. And it allows them to sort of watch and track how the water moves and mixes as it goes down the river. It's hydrology and it's very complicated. So with those pictures of the dye trays, that was one example of kind of taking science and making it beautiful and making people curious about it because you're taking science that's never gonna leave the pages of a peer-reviewed journal and making it something that people get drawn to. And those images now were run on National Geographic. 
And so by telling stories about scientists, we can not only communicate the science that they're doing in a way that's effective, in a way that helps people understand maybe that aren't scientists, but it also makes scientists more relatable. There's a huge learning curve to taking pictures underwater and I think I sort of learned it backwards like I learned photography through underwater photography. The number one thing is being really comfortable in the water and so then you're not stirring up the bottom or using a lot of air when you're breathing um, off a scuba tank or you can calm yourself enough to do free diving but I think the number one key and the number one way that I learned was just a lot of time and a lot of practice and I had some great mentors as well. So the setup I'm using right now is a Nikon 850 in, in Nauticam housing with two strobes that are attached to it. So there's two lights on camera. And then when I go into the caves, if I'm gonna shoot in there, it's completely pitch dark. So you can have, you know, 11 off camera lights in a picture. And it can be quite tricky when you're in the cave doing that because the lighting itself is kind of an art. I have some pictures over time of this area. There used to be giant meadows of beautiful green grass all around the edge of this, and now it's totally gone. We can just imagine this entire spring run fall of those grasses, like really thick, giant, um, big meadows. So when I first started swimming in the springs, they were full of this lush native vegetation, Sagittaria crozena and Valsinaria americana. All of a sudden, um, the grasses started going away. And now, as you can see in some of my long-term time-lapse photos, these areas that used to be um, totally green and full of lush grass are now either barren sand or algae. This has happened at most of the springs in the state. From an ecological perspective, the difference between a sandy bottom spring and one that's full of native plants is incredibly different. It doesn't have stuff for the turtles to eat, doesn't have places for the snails to graze, it doesn't have places for fish to hide. It kind of just goes straight to your gut, like what happens? Nitrates from like fertilizer and farms have an impact on the amount of grasses that can grow light impacts what can grow there and actually when we saw the biggest decrease in grasses was during Irma, Hurricane Irma, because the river flooded and it blacked out the springs for enough time that the plants couldn't photosynthesize and they all died. And so to add the complexity on top of all these different things that are happening in the spring, you also have climate change and the impacts of hurricanes. Communicating science through imagery is important because images are much easier for some people to understand than statistics or really technical scientific writing. Through images, we can not only make science beautiful and maybe make it something that catches someone's eye, but also to communicate the impacts that we are having on the planet.